Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and we first met my guest today on the red carpet of the Soho International Film Festival. He's the director of the award-winning indie feature, Misty Button, Mr. Shawnee Shagru. Welcome, Shawnee. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure. Hey, great great to be here. I know that you're, uh, you're normally uh, on the left coast. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of the planet there. Uh, so I'm glad to catch you while you were... You bounce back and forth. I pretty regularly, yeah. Okay. It's hard to keep me out of New York for a significant amount of time. But And this movie is a New York movie. It's all set here, yeah, in the Bronx. Very Bronx, cool. Yonkers, and we actually shot a little bit in Brooklyn, too. Very cool. Um, I want to talk about the movie, but before we do that, I want to talk to you about you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always ask all my guests, uh, how did you get your start? How, what, what got you into directing? Like, what is your origin story? So I'm from Ireland originally. Couldn't um, tell. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were just there, actually, with the film. But I'm from Ireland originally, and uh, I, I'm from a place called Kerry. And uh, we have a long history of a lot of great writers from Kerry. Um, my favorite part probably being John B. King, who wrote The Field. Um, which was a play that was adapted into a film starring Richard Harris, who's one of my favorite actors. And we were actually just at the Richard Harris Film Festival. So um, I grew up, to be honest, not around any artists. Um, I had a pretty active imagination. I kind of preferred to live in a fantasy land than reality, which is kind of still the case some days. But um, when I, I moved to New York when I was 21, and that was kind of when I finally started being surrounded by artists and um, in 2009 I took a bartending job on uh, 34th Street and one of the other bartenders I worked with uh, Josh Folan who worked on a film called Ask for Jane which you guys had on the show he was working on a film and I had been taking writing classes for a few years um, you know there's a line in Misty Budden writing is difficult which is something I um, used to tell a lot of people so true it is it's difficult yeah so um I was struggling with writing a screenplay for years, years and years, and um, I had the whole idea in my head, but I could never execute it onto a page. And uh, one time I pitched the idea to Josh, um, the story of uh, five guys waking up and there was someone dead in the bathtub and no one knew who, 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 who the culprit was or, who, or what happened. And we ended up shooting the film. We ended up doing like three Kickstarter campaigns. Josh directed the film. Um, we failed the Kickstarter. And the, it, actually, it was two Kickstarter campaigns on that one. We failed the first time, and you know when you fail Kickstarter, you don't you you get no money, so you have to go back and do it again, um, which was a nightmare. Crowdfunding is a nightmare. But uh, so we shot the film, and it, it, it made it to a few festivals, uh, and then we shot another film. Um, but while we were trying to find the money to shoot that film, Josh gave me a play one day called A Dark Dark House by Neil Labute, and I I devoured that play. I loved it. And um, I turned to playwriting instead of screenwriting because because making the film was also difficult. And uh, I was like, I'm done with independent filmmaking for a while. So I ended up writing and directing six plays, um, putting them all up in New York. And the fourth one, Love is Dead, we adapted into a film. Josh directed that. Um, we shot it like a really dark sitcom uh, with a laughing track. And, uh, and then I kind of got... I did another couple of plays, and then I got back into writing um, screenplays again. And uh, I did a couple of short films, and then I wrote a feature, which was set in Woodlawn, which is where I lived back in 2005 when I moved to New York, super Irish neighborhood in the Bronx, a unique place. And uh, I ended up writing a script that was set there, uh, Misty Budden, and uh, we, we shot it uh, last June of 2018. So uh, the film uh, was screened at Soho. Uh, you guys have been in the festival circuit for a little bit now. Mm -hmm. For those who haven't seen it or, or don't know about it, what's the wh how would you give me like the Hollywood log line of like what's the film about kind of thing? Woodlawn is very Irish. Like it's the closest thing to being in Ireland when you're in America, for sure. We c there's 32 counties in Ireland, and we joke that Woodlawn is the 33rd county. Um, you can walk down. You're walking down Katona and McLean. There's two streets for the most part. So you're walking down Katona. All the shops have the local papers from back in Ireland, like small newspapers. All the food products are Irish. Um, and it's also, and it was, I don't know what it's like now. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. I'm sure it's changed. But back in 2005, it felt a little lawless up there. You know, you could smoke in the bars. There was bookies in the bars. You could gamble. And 
there was a few Sundays I went out drinking. I knew nothing about American football, but I bet on the games. And waking up the next morning and uh, being down money that you don't remember losing, you know. So, and I also bartended in Ireland when I was 14. So, um, and my job in Ireland was someone, usually an old man. It was like an old man's bar. Old man would come in. He'd say, Shawnee, stick me out a pint of Guinness. He'd say, Shawnee, stick me out a pint of Guinness. And um, I would start a pint and then he'd give me money to go across the street and put it on a horse. And I'd put the money on the horse. I'd come back, give him his ticket and a pint of Guinness at the same time. So there was this one guy that would always lose. Like every single time he came in there, he would lose. And he gave me a tenner one day. And he never asked me for the slip unless he won. So he gave me 10, uh, 10 it was Irish pounds actually. He gave me 10 uh, pounds. And he said, go across there and put the money on this horse for me. So I go across the street. And uh, I walk in, and the horse's name was Barcelona. I still remember it. <laughs> and the horse was 17 to 1 in a six-horse race. So I was like, this horse isn't going to win. So I put the tenor in my pocket. I went back across the street. This was my first ever acting performance. Walk in behind the bar, top up his pint of Guinness, give it to him. I say nothing. So I watched the race, and the acting performance was, now I'm cheering for the horse out loud. <laughs> but in- internally, I'm like, I hope it loses. I do not have... <laughs> I do not have the money to pay this guy out his winnings. So we watched the race. The horse is winning at first, and then it ends up coming in last. Now, that's a story I actually remembered way after in post-production. And it was the inspiration for the film. Misty Button was about two guys in Woodlawn. They meet a guy. They're both out of the look, two kind of loser-type dudes. And they uh, they get given a lot more money. They're given ten grand to go to a bar in uh, Woodlawn. Uh, or, well, they they meet the guy in Woodlawn, and they have to go down to Harlem and put uh, ten grand on a horse called Misty Button, the name of the film. So they end up getting there a little too early. They start drinking. A bag of cocaine appears out of nowhere, and they decide the horse is thirty five to one for a reason. It's not going to win. So they put the money in. They they keep the money. They don't put the bet in. And of course, Misty Button, unlike Barcelona, comes in first place. <laughs> so now they owe the guy, and it's not even his money. So now it's actually but the money belonged to the mob. So they're it's a a very dark comedy, a buddy love comedy about two guys that now now have to work for the the mafia in the Bronx. And who do you have starring in this picture? Killian O'Sullivan played the lead. James Sheehan, who's from Truly County Kerry, like myself. That's about all we have in common, or so I tell people. And um, Kelly and I, I'd actually seen him on an episode of Vikings, and uh, a friend of ours who also produced on the film from Tralee uh, mentioned him to me, and he was in town at the time working on a play. So I reached out to Kelly, and he loved the script, and he ended up uh, taking the role. John Keating, who's been on Boardwalk Empire, and he's done a lot of TV work, but he's a very well-known theater actor in New York. He plays Timmy Thomas, Sean Kennedy, Julia Nightingale, who was on The Ferryman on Broadway, amazing young actress. Victoria Mead, another wonderful actress. So we, we got really lucky with the casting, which really is what carries the film. The acting is amazing. Yeah, it's a nice ensemble. And, uh, you know, Killian is a very char- charismatic guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we interviewed, if you guys check out the uh, Soho recap episode, you'll see our interview with the, the Lottie uh, mm-hmm. on the red carpet there with him. Uh, I think he, he was he was the first f bomb ever on the show, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then while apologizing, he f bombed again the second time. He said, <laughs> "Yeah, so, so it was twice uh, yeah. in like ten seconds, which is very killing it." Yeah, well, you know, I was just like, "That's part of his charm." So I, I'm he's like, got the Colin Farrell thing going, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people t- have made that comparison. Tall, handsome guy, uh, but he he's uh, he's very good in the actually. Everyone's very good in the film. Yeah, uh, and uh, performances all the way around. But one thing. Uh, is everybody who's supposed to be Irish in the in the movie actually Irish? Great or question. Have, or do you have Americans doing? There's uh, a couple, there's, and I and I never give it away, but I always ask, who do you think? Um, Gerard McNamee, who plays Uncle Frank, um, his parents are actually from Tyrone, and he just looks so Irish that even if he had done a bad job, he would have got away with it. But his Irish accent's very strong, and he right. he spent a lot of his youth uh, in Ireland, and then Hannah Jane McMurray. Who played Haley, the the redhead ex uh, ex wife? Um, she is from California, and oh, again, yeah. and she did an amazing. You know, she didn't do like a general Irish. She had a really good friend from Dublin, a specific part of Dublin, and she really she she nailed it. And 
the film screened now in two Irish film festivals, and not one person has known until I told them that she wasn't Irish, yeah. which is a hell of a compliment. Yeah, she looks quite Irish as well. You she's know, she's got the red hair and, and the right face and everything. Like yeah, that, exactly. You know? Yeah, I met uh, her for a cup of coffee one day, and she showed up with that red hair, wearing that green jumper. And I said, Hannah, can you wear that in the film? You look so <laughs> Irish right now. And she did. Yeah, she, uh, she, she really does. And I, I, I bartended in, in New York in 2005, and a guy called Kevin Bresnahan used to drink there. And uh, he was in Superbad, and I knew him from that. And I stayed in touch with him ever since. We were good friends, and he also did a cameo, which was great. You made this movie. This is uh, a real indie picture. Talk to me about some of the challenges that you guys had making it, because... You you made it a fairly a pretty short amount of time. An experienced filmmaker will probably gasp hearing this, but we shot all 124 pages in nine days. And this is a dialogue heavy script. It is very dialogue heavy because you know being a, a playwright who is a huge Samuel Beckett fan, uh, it, it was very very heavy. Um, but uh, there was a lot of challenges. You know who who actually made life really hard for us, and you might laugh is uh, Martin Scorsese. Oh, was he shooting? He shot The Irishman right before we shot Misty Button. So we were going to all these, lo- and he shot a lot of it in Woodlawn. So we were going to a lot of these locations being like, hey, we want to shoot here. Um, how much would it cost to come in here one night and shoot a scene? They're like, well, Martin Scorsese just gave us $40,000 a month ago. So that would be good. <laughs> so um, we didn't have Netflix in our pocket, unfortunately. Right. But um, we had a diner, actually, that they shot um, some of The Irishman in, and it's called The Goodfellas Diner in Maspet because they shot Goodfellas in there. And uh, they agreed to let us shoot there. And a couple of days before the shoot, me and Patrick Shearer, who played Declan, he's the editor, and he, he wore a million hats. He, um, I said to him, I goes, I haven't heard from that guy at uh, the Goodfellas Diner. I need to give him, a, give him a call. So Pat said, well, what's the number? I said, just Google it. I don't know. So Pat Googles Goodfellas Diner, and the first thing that came up is, you can't make it up, Goodfellas Diner burns down last night. <laughs> oh my it's still god. closed. Yeah. Oh my god. So we lost that location, and we lost a couple of other the night before. Um, we had a lot of challenges, but the the biggest thing, and in, in hindsight, you know, we didn't. It was a low budget film. We cut corners, and one corner we cut was not having a, a qualified electrician on set. Mm. You know, Pat was the grip, and he was also an actor in the film, and he also edited the film. He wore a million oh hats, god. and he was amazing. The gaffer, you know, had never gaffed before. The AD. Um, I don't know if she had AD'd before, she was, but she did an amazing job. Um, and it was just a lot of people that were kind of underqualified for the roles that just showed up and, and killed it and didn't complain about how long the days were. And we had such a, a great camaraderie on set. I don't think one person complained once, despite the fact we were doing these insane days. And it was just the, the one thing I did right on the whole project was I found an amazing team. And that's what that's why we were able to do it. And you can use those people again if you want to you know, do another. Fil- Surprisingly, film here in New York. everyone's still talking to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the hardest part, like you mentioned, a couple of things. One is location. Uh, mm-hmm. That's probably the hardest thing for anybody, especially in a, a town like New York, where mm-hmm. everything is is expensive and you don't have Martin Scorsese money to throw around. Yeah. But uh, locations, and then finding a good crew that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, a lot of times on these indie films. You do have that, you know, this person's never done that before. Mm-hmm. You you know, you have to bring up people or you're having, you know, what would be, a, you know, a second, uh, you know, AC is is the PA who stepped up to the AC role. Pull in focus. Know, yeah, yeah, that's actually something that happened. You know, so it, this stuff happens a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have to kind of learn how to roll with it. And as a director, uh, and you're, if you're director, producer, you know, you're biting your nails the whole time just thinking, oh, God, I want to make it through yeah. this day. Um, but it's a good thing that you didn't have a lot of action in the movie or like there's not a lot of action or special effects in the no, film. No, no. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of knew writing the script that, all right, you know, it's unrealistic to think that on the first feature film that you're going to direct that you're going to go and get $10 million to shoot this. So I kept that in mind. Um, one of the other big challenges was, you know, as the director having a conversation with the DP, but you also have to have the pro- your, the producer in you in the room too. So it's like, yeah, I really want to get that shot, Mike, but we don't have six hours to set up for it, you know. So, I, you know, it would be a great thing one day to be on a set and just be the director and not have to worry about the producing and actually arguing 
with the DP against the, the producer and not just a civil war in your head. Yeah, it's really hard. And, you know, if you're the writer, too, like I've literally been on set where it's like, oh, my God, who wrote this? Why Why? Mm-hmm. Why is there so much dialogue here? <laughs> like mm-hmm. you find yourself wanting to, you know, cut stuff on the day and rearrange stuff. And mm-hmm. I've seen, you know, I've seen like Peter Bogdanovich do that, you know, like where he's, you know, in the middle of a film and they're sort of running out of time and mm-hmm. he's cutting dialogue. And, you know, you don't want to be in that position, but you have to have that movie in your head enough Mm -hmm. to go I know what it's going to look like so yeah do we really need that scene do we really need this bit you know and it's hard it and it breaks your bloody heart you know every Mm -hmm. time it really does yeah you're just like oh man I I hate to I don't want to I don't want to kill this scene but I want to make you know so you you lose a a battle to win the war kind of thing yeah when you're against time though yeah you're right every scene does it have to be in the film you know and the one thing we had going for us is we didn't move around a lot. Like we, I came up with the shooting uh, schedule, and there was a lot of locations. Like we had a church that we found, and the guy gave us the keys to the church for a week on Catone Avenue, which ended up being our home base. It was amazing, and that served for four locations in the film that looked completely different. So there was no day that we had, okay, now we got to go drive an hour and a half to the next location. It was all, that's kind of what saved us was not having to commute. And that's having to pack up and move is an absolute killer. It really is. It's also something we've talked about on the on the show before, and it's like locations and transportation. Not just the time it takes, but the cost of moving people and equipment and all that stuff around. You can really do yourself a disservice if you if you you haven't done that well. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I've talked to people who've done you know low budget movies under two hundred thousand, under one hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, we did everything like on the same block, mm-hmm. or we had you know a house that we used in the woods, and that was it. You know, we used that, and then mm-hmm. like the woods behind it, and this way we could keep our production office there. Because one of the things that I think people don't realize is that there's so many people involved on a movie because you had a, a pretty good sized cast. We did, yeah. There's yeah. forty something actors and how, in the film. Yeah, and, and yeah. how how many uh, how many crew altogether? You know, like guys like Gerard, who played Uncle Frank, is a really, also you know a good friend of mine that just was so into it and still is. And he was like, you know, I'm shooting four of the nine days. You know, I'm going to be on set. The other five helping out. And you know, we had a guy like Chris Tierney who had one shot in the whole film, but he showed up six other days to help out. And Josh Saul showed up one night and. You know, things like that. And there was just so much love on the set. Like, But people showing up know they're not getting paid to be here for 10, 12, 16 hours. But I want to be here. That's what saved us, really. But the crew at any, you know, I don't think we ever had more than 12 crew members on wow. set. Wow. Yeah. So, you, you know, you're doing this with a small amount of people, which mm-hmm. is probably good, you know, because, A, you're going to save money just not having to feed 35 people mm-hmm. every day. That's the other you thing, know, yeah. Or, or transport all those people and the... Uh, you know, it, it's a double-edged sword because on one hand, you said, you, you know, I, I'm like you. I, when I'm on a set, I'm doing everything. Mm-hmm. I'm a producer, writer, director. Uh, I'm doing I'm doing five different jobs. And it would be like a luxury just to show up and direct. Oh, you know? my, yeah. And would, then have mm-hmm. somebody, the producer, tell me what to do and say, okay, now is meal break and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. you do um, – and, and it hurt. Of course, the movie's not ever going to be as good if you were doing 15 jobs. But then again, you got to get the movie done. Mm-hmm. And this is the way that some people have to do it. Uh, and, you know, hopefully it's the next movie that benefits from it. You know, cause, exactly. Because I'm sure you learned a lot on this picture. You yeah. Know, that, you, you know, just going through the the pain of it, you know, to get it to the, to get it done. Like mm-hmm. and, and I've said so many times it, it's so hard just to get the movie in the can you know just to get it through prep through production and then you go on to post and it's like okay we Mm -hmm. got the movie made and then you gotta worry about things like distribution and marketing and film festivals and that's like a whole other job Mm -hmm. that you wish you had somebody else to do uh most of the time but like for you um this was your first feature that you'd ever done the first one that i directed i i co-wrote uh two and produced two features before um and I learned a lot, and I learned a lot from Josh. Um, but when you're kind of in charge of things, like Josh carried me and showed me a lot of things. But now on this film, um, you know, he was working on Ask for Jane. I didn't have the liberty of having someone really experienced 
to help me solve You were the solutions. experienced one on this one. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you know, I was making decisions that perhaps I wasn't qualified to be making. But a lot of people on set, too, each day gradually got way better at their jobs. So after the first four days, we ended up owing scenes every day. And uh, on day five, we had a day off, but me, the DP, and Pat, and a few more of us still worked. And going into day six, something went wrong. And um, so there's three guns in the film. Um, I was the art director, Kim, who was a beast on set. And one of the main reasons this film got in the can in the first place, she gave me the briefcase and said, OK, return the gun that we don't need anymore. So we'll save some money. So I said, sure, I'll return the gun. So I take the gun back. I drop it on the desk in this gun's place in Long Island City. Uh, I leave. I show up to uh, set day six. Kim goes, where are the two guns? I goes, what are you talking about? She goes, I goes, I brought the gun back. She goes, all three guns were in the case. I thought it was only the one gun. So now we're shooting like the scene where all the, the scenes are where we need two guns. So there's nothing we can shoot without the guns. And it's a Sunday. So the place is closed. So we end up changing the entire shooting schedule. We sent home the actors we had and we called actors that weren't even in New York City at the time that came and showed up to set. We changed a whole shooting schedule around. And because of that, you know, serendipity is a word we throw around a lot. Because of that, we met up so much that night that we, we ended up, by the, by the end of day nine, we ended up owing nothing. And it was all because of that mistake that happened. So it's funny how these things happen, right? You know, the, the, the pain of filmmaking is that you never actually get what you want. You right. Know, you always get an approximation. Or sometimes it, it, you do have serendipity, and sometimes it works out better. You, you know, yeah, that's what happened for yeah, us, yeah. Which is, you know, it's like this stroke of luck. And, you know, people talk about happy accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, Orson Welles said that a director, a film director, is somebody who presides over accidents. What do you say? What would you say was the key? Because you know, doing directing your first feature is always uh, it, it's always a mountain to climb. I mm -hmm. think for anybody, uh, what would you say would be like if you could, if you now could go back in time and talk to yourself then? What advice would you give yourself at the beginning if you could before in the pre prep stage? What would you tell yourself? You know, that's a great question, and there, and there's so much. You know, you, obviously you would say go find another twenty grand before you shoot the film. <laughs> So you can hire an electrician, you know. But um, I think, you know, rehearsal, We, re I, I found actors that were just so willing. And I just found a lot of people that really believed in the script. And they and they gave up their time a week, two weeks before we shot the film and, and, and helped and actually rehearsed. If it wasn't for rehearsal, we were screwed. But, you know, I think just trusting people, which I, I, in, I ended up getting to that point by the end of the shoot. But um, starting out, just trusting the process. Um, if I, I, I tell everyone, you know, if I had had the time, I would have cried myself to sleep every night during that, sh that shoot, but I didn't get to sleep. Um, I would probably, the, the hardest part of the whole shoot was that I lived in Bushwick, and the DP who flew in from L.A. was living in Bushwick. And every night, you know, or morning, we had to get back to Bushwick for Mike had the camera and whatnot. So I would say that if I could do anything differently, and even out of pocket, I would have done it. I would have paid for a driver. Because I, I was working 20-hour days, and then I was driving from Woodlawn, which is up in the tip-top of the Bronx, the last stop on the 4 train, all the way down to Bushwick to, the like, near the Myrtle M stop on the train. Yeah, for you non-New Yorkers out there, that's a hike. Yeah, and it was during some mornings during rush hour traffic, and, like, literally, I would I was at a red light. I, put, I would put the car in park. I would close my eyes, fall asleep for 30 seconds, knowing that eventually the guy behind me is going to beep the horn and wake me back up. That's how bad it got by the end of it, you know, because you're you know, not sleeping for two weeks and then driving, and there's there's no no worse place to be in the world for me than behind the wheel of a car when you're exhausted. Yeah. So I would say just be like, if you're planning on working a 20-hour day and then driving home, it's I would always say find someone that's having a less chaotic day to drive the car and, and the van too. Pat would drive the van. And, you know, he nearly fell asleep behind the wheel one night. And uh, I would say, it's funny, you know, you think, what's the hardest part of, of shooting a film? And honestly, looking back, I'd say it was the driving. Yeah, and I, like you said, it's something people don't think about. Yeah, you know? one of our producers, John McGinty, uh, who was an executive producer, um, funded a lot of, the, a big part of the film. He showed up and was a PA every day, and he also worked the 20-hour days. And he ended up, luckily, it was, we just found this out at a film festival like a month ago. He rear-ended a garbage truck on his way home one oh, day. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, but it wasn't that which damaged him, but, like, that's another example of the, the like, 
hire a driver. For you guys right now, you're still doing the festival circuit uh, as of now, and you're mm -hmm. hoping to get distribution next year? Yeah, we're hoping in the spring. So we, we've had great luck with the festivals. You know, it's it's funny when it rains, it pours. And in this, like, October, November, I think we were in seven different film festivals or something, like, a lot like that. Two were in Ireland. One was in Kerry, where I'm from, which was amazing. It's a great film festival. Um, and the other was the Richard Harris Festival in Limerick. And uh, we've been in talks with a lot. Like, the film is Irish and... Um, but it's in America, and it's you know it appeal. It, what we've really been happy with is that Americans are picking up on the humor and they're enjoying it too. But um, we we have said from the start that our best um, transfer distribution is out of Ireland. So we've been going through a lot. We've been in, taking meetings and talking to a lot of distribution companies in Ireland. So we're going to see what happens with that. I'm all, and uh, but I did also want to finish the festival circuit before signing anything. So we have a few deals right now. We met our world premiere on St. Patrick's Day in San Luis Obispo, and we're hoping to release uh, in 2019 this year. And we're hoping to release the film on St. Patrick's Day 2020. Fabulous, fabulous. So I'm going to wrap up for. But for those out there who want to know more about you or about the movie, where can they find you on the web? Yeah, so I'm on the usual Instagram, Facebook uh, under Shawnee Shukru. Um, and uh, the film is also on Instagram and Facebook under Misty Button. And our website is www.mistybutton.com. Great. Uh, so thanks for coming. and uh, Thanks for having me, man. And I'm a big fan of the show. Oh, I'm so glad. It's, it warms my heart to hear that somebody's Living in out L.A. There. podcasts <laughs> save you. So <laughs> keep, keep them coming. Speaking of driving. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, speaking of driving. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up, but thanks for coming, and thank you all out there for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes and for more of our content, including our movie reviews, you can find them on our podcast on our website, norestoftheweekendpodcast.com. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and now we're on Patreon, so you can find us on patreon.com slash no rest of the weekend uh, once again shawnee thank you for for schlepping all the way to brooklyn to do this interview thank I you really for appreciate having it. me man thank you for joining us for behind the rabbit productions i'm jason godby we'll see you next time